ISIS believes if they're killed by a woman, they don't go to heaven. They go to hell. It's an insult to them to be killed by women. People will ask, do you think they deserve to die? I don't know. What I do know is that I like the world I live in now. I like my friends. I like to have a good time. I like to have fun. I like to enjoy the beautiful things around me. These people want to destroy them. So to me, it's like, I don't care if they deserve to die. What, what I think is they don't deserve to live in the same world I'm in. Well, they don't want to get killed by the women. So I wrote that poem for them. And it says, fear us women, O enemies of humanity, for you who die by our hands will burn in hell forever. I hadn't actually heard of ISIS until the summer of 2014. Uh, one of my co-workers was showing me a video. When ISIS came across from Iraq into Syria, they were capturing villages and cities, and they were raping the women and murdering the men and butchering the children. You know, in my mind, I don't see them as humans. When they first showed up, they had a lot of support to start with, and they didn't have a, an adversary that was willing to stand up against them. And certainly in some places, they were happy to have them there, mainly because they thought that they were better than who was there last time. But then when reality sinks in, they realize, oh no, this is much worse. A bunch of things happened that made me look at my life and reevaluate it. I was hit by a car on my motorbike, you know, and I realized I'd spent too much of my life doing things I don't really want to do, you know, things you do because you have to make a living. I had the good fortune of growing up in a very safe country where, where in other places they, you know, they struggle just to get by every day. I've always been very aware of that and very conscious of that, and I've always wanted to pay it forward, my good fortune of having grown up in Canada. We don't build our lives out of nothing. We build our lives out of opportunities. And what other people in the world, like in Syria, they don't have opportunities. They're, they're told this is the way you live, and if you try to move out of that, then we will oppress you, we will kill you, arrest you, torture you, whatever, right? You're forced to be this way. I really started to follow the war in Syria and what ISIS was doing. I was wondering if people could join ISIS, if people could volunteer to fight with ISIS. There must be a way for people to volunteer to fight against ISIS. And then I heard about the YPJ. It's an all-women's army. Its, it's primary goal is to bring women's rights to the Middle East. YPJ stands for Yekanin Peristina Jin. Translated, it means Women's Protection Unit. It's women protecting women. <laughs> I thought this would be a great thing to join. I wanted to be a part of them. You know, I watched all the videos and I read all the material I put on them and stuff like that. And I thought, I don't want to watch this anymore. I want to be there. I want to see it. I really wanted to help with the women's revolution. And then I found out about a recruiting page on Facebook and I contacted that page. And then they put me in touch with a YPJ recruiter, and it just went from there. And that was uh, October 2014. She used to be a fashion model and a biker, but one day Hannah Bowman decided to switch her life of comfort in Canada for the unforgiving battlefields of Syria, and is one of many Western volunteers to have joined the Kurdish-led fight against Islamic State. I was never a professional model. I dabbled in it almost 15 years ago. You know, I'd rather be known as, you know, the Canadian who joined the fight for women's rights, not the ex-model who, you know, all the things to be known by, that's kind of lame. And what's particularly annoying is that when a new story comes out, oh, the ex-model did this and that, there's always people commenting and there's like, what kind of model was she, like a hand model? She's hideous. Right? So it's just like you missed the whole point of the story. The point of the story is that women are fighting ISIS. 
right? The complete opposite. You have the ISIS that wants to enslave the world, and then you have the YPJ that wants to free the world, and they're fighting each other, good versus evil in the truest sense. And all you're worried about is some fucking chick that you may or may not have been a model at one time. You know? The first time I was smuggled across the border into Syria, we had to drive for quite a ways to get to the border, and, and it was a river crossing, so in the middle of the night, we had to go across in a rubber dinghy. It was really inspiring to see people from all over coming to join. Like, there's, a, there's some Swedish girls, a British girl, a Polish girl, Italian girl, you know, some Canadian girls. I think the first time I was smuggled over there, I was just so caught up in the adventure of it all that I was just amazed. Like, you know, it felt so much better than what I was doing back home. I was the, the third Western woman at the time, so they were still trying to figure things out. I was supposed to go for 15 days of training, end up being five days. All I learned was to, to hear out the AK. At the academy, they gave me an AK and they took me to the range and, like, you know, see how well I could shoot that. And uh, I used Denise's gun, the girl that they had sent to instruct me. She was, like, really impressed. She was like, oh, I have a sniper. So then they gave me the sniper rifle. See what I'm trying to do? Yeah. I'm trying to make you not focus. Because in war, you'll... It would not be my voice. You had gunshots and all kinds of weapons. I ran. That was scary. You should warn me, women. <laughs> hmm? You should warn me. I'm gonna shoot. Uh, now I've been stationed to a unit. This is my unit. Um, about a kilometer away from Dash, which is what they call ISIS. We do everything on the dirt. We sleep on the dirt. We work on the dirt. We cook on the dirt. We eat on the dirt. And we shit on the dirt. I'm in my, <clears throat> this is my bunker. It's Thailand. This is, this is my gun. There are many guns like it. This one is mine. If I had to describe what it's like out here, it's a good healthy dose of Mad Max. Because a lot of the stuff here is homemade and looks Mad Max-ish. And uh, it's like Touch of Survivor. It's really just camping. Just camping with guns, that's all it is. And uh, hunting people instead of deer. I didn't have any communication with the outside world for, I think it was six weeks at first. Especially in the beginning, cell phones were banned completely. Turns out my father died the, the day after I sent out my last message. So a month ago. I wasn't close to my father or anything. I barely knew him. No way I was going to spend thousands of dollars and rush back there to see some stranger on his deathbed. I mean, I feel bad for him dying of cancer like that, but whatever. We all die one way or the other. I can get a bullet in my head any time now. Well, I think I was there about six weeks and I was going crazy. Most of the time I spent waiting for something to happen. And the commanders, they could tell though. So I ended up going to a different unit, a mobile unit, a fighting unit. And my first night there, uh, we get in a firefight. So I'm just like, yeah, okay, this is where I want to be. I'm happy now. I think it was the second or third day I was walking from the outhouse back to where we were staying and a sniper started shooting at me. Right about here, and all of a sudden you could hear it <laughs> cross and then hear the gunshot. So I hit the ground and then it was like, <laughs> another one. So the sniper's definitely gunning for me. I'm gonna have to mess with them somehow. I was the sniper in my unit. I was the only sniper in my unit. Like a real sniper, you need patience, right? You have to be able to lie in the dirt, in the heat all day. Camel spiders walking on you. favorite tactic of ISIS is the suicide truck. And the more desperate they get, the more trucks they send. Of course, you don't want them coming near you. In my one unit, we had five trucks come at us in one day. You just want to keep the enemy as far away from you as you can, right? You see them, you shoot at them. You don't want them getting close enough to you that they can start throwing grenades and shit at you. Keep them away. You know, if you can kill them, great. All I know is that when we are shooting them, 
when we are killing them, the girls are doing that Middle East yodel to let them know that it's the women who are killing you. Like in the beginning, I would wonder, you know, like, oh, well, you know, they had somebody, they had a mother that loved them and stuff like that. Now it's just like my friends had mothers that loved them too. The best way to describe Kobani at that time was obliterated. I mean, so many were killed there. It really is the martyred city. And it's just rubble. A lot of kids living in the rubble. The country's been reduced to nothing, so, yeah, I don't blame them for wanting to leave. The refugees were just fleeing Syria. Some went across the border in Turkey and then took rafts over to Greece. I feel sorry for the ones that stayed, actually, because there's so much. There's no guarantee of peace in the future. There's always going to be another war. They had an opportunity to leave, and they took it. I don't blame them at all. We would do the same thing. Now they have a chance at a new life. We would all do the same thing. I would. A lot of people keep asking me to help them get to Canada. If I had a seat on a plane for everybody who asked me to help them, the plane would be full. I was not used to hanging around with a lot of girls. I didn't grow up in the West hanging out with girls. You know, as a tomboy, most of my friends were boys and stuff, so I used to fight and throw rocks and climb trees with them. But, uh, you know, by the time I went to my second unit, I was really starting to bond with the girls. people are shooting at you and you're shooting back, I think that kind of stress, you know, knowing that we're living on that edge is what brings us close together. You know, we all suffer together. So like the girls in my units, I love them so much. Whoa, 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 not too much gas. You're gonna do a wheelie. The YPJ is an all-women's army, but we share the fight with the men. We're in the trenches with the men. The person sitting next to you with the RPG could be a guy or a girl. It's, it's equal like that. The biggest battle I was in was Calabria. June 14th. 14th? June 14th. It's a good day. Sunday. Sunday. Ah, Hi, Mom. <laughs> <laughs> it was a key city, because as soon as we took Calabria, then we cut off ISIS supplies from Turkey. So we jumped into what's called what we call the pig. It's a it's a bulldozer with steel plates welded on it. And we headed to the front line. for this bridge and, and we would crawl up to the bridge and then ISIS would start shooting at us, which would reveal their position. So then we would pull back and then we would call airstrikes in their position. At one point I saw a bunch of guys running across the road on the bridge within like two minutes, boom, airstrike. <laughs> They're not standing there anymore. <laughs> we had to capture the bridge to get to the city, right? There's some senior commanders there, and they're just like, okay, you six, go take it. You know, there's like 100 ISIS fighters there, and we're supposed to be the six of us. We're the, we're the attacking party on Tel Aviv. So I'm on the berm looking at the city, which is about 500 meters away still. I see two guys in a, like a staircase, and one of them is like in the prone position, so you know, he's a, he's a sniper. Well, I guess the sniper was looking at me at the same time because all day you hear bullets going by, but then, you know, I heard it go by, but I also felt it just over the top of my head. 
back on the Right now. Uh, our group of six has turned into a group of 20. I don't know if you can see it, but we started in this building down here. Came up in the tank, crossed this bridge that was almost it's all blown up. I almost fell in. Uh, I'm 46 years old and too old for this shit. That's no protein diet for the last three months. I've lost so much muscle mass. Right now. <clears throat> Nash is just over this hill, and uh, they have a hunt spot, so we're letting loose on it with Big C and Sniper. So that's the way we spent the day. About 7 o'clock that evening, though, we were finally able to capture the bridge. And then uh, we held it overnight. Kurdish forces in Syria have taken almost a full control of the border town of Tal Abiyad from the ISIL terrorists. It was the fight that had a definite result. I mean, there were some other fights I had been in, but that was the one that had a definite result. It seems to go from fighting to celebrating pretty quick. You have to make peace with the fact that you, you could die to go do this. You can't go there thinking, oh, it's not going to happen to me. Because it happens. It, it happens so much. Like, one of the guys I was on that burn with was killed. And this is kind of a weird thing, but I actually like the fighting. I like the sound and the smell and the stress and the ground shaking and all that. I like that. There are people that are wired to fight, right? I've always kind of liked fighting. I grew up fighting. I grew up fighting with boys, right? I think if you let it bother you, if it gets to you, then you're just going to make yourself sick. You're just going to drive yourself nuts. The stuff that people would assume would bother me, like all the bodies and the body parts and the smell of burning people, doesn't bother me at all. When somebody dies, so like someone from our unit gets killed, we bury them. And then we decorate the grave. It's very emotional. I've helped bury three comrades, three friends. In Tel Aviv in 2015, I had lost 30 pounds. I was really sick. I'd had a, a moment where I realized just how weak I had become. I've lost weight. This is a no-no here. Started over, can't see. Started over here, <laughs> and way over here. I saw myself in the mirror for the first time in three months the other day. If I keep losing weight, I'm going to have to come back. There's just no way, this is just not healthy. I'd lost 30 pounds in three months, and I couldn't, when I went there, I was about 145 pounds. I had become so weak, I could barely hold my gear up. A week or two later, I was on my way home. I went home thinking that I was done. Uh, physical exhaustion had manifested into mental exhaustion. But after a few weeks of eating normal food and resting and stuff like that, I realized I wasn't done. And I felt so guilty. You know, I'd go to a restaurant, I'd be eating steak and drinking wine, and I was thinking about the girls in my units who were back here just eating crushed tomatoes and rice, drinking dirty water and stuff. I don't know. They always say, oh, why would you Westerners leave the comfort of your home, your safe countries to come here and help people you don't even know? I believe they deserve to be as free as I am in my country. As a Western volunteer, we have the luxury of always going home. But over there, they don't. They're stuck there. That's it. I mean, they have to live it. They don't get to go home. That is their home. So I support them completely, right? Because they're, they're trying to build something that we've taken for granted. I get a lot of death threats from the enemy online. Uh, they like to send me messages uh, telling, saying what they're going to do to me and stuff like that. Uh, some of the death threats I received from ISIS guys, saying things are they can't wait to watch a video where I get my head cut off, stuff like that. A lot of rape, 
violence, you know, sexual violence. It's this no holds barred stuff. Many of us have a, a last bullet to kill ourselves instead of being captured by ISIS. If our capture is imminent and there's no hope for rescue, we'll kill ourselves. The ISIS gets a hold of us, especially as a Westerner, they would make a big propaganda video about it, but yeah, they get a hold of us and they'll just torture us, rape us and stuff like that. So we'd rather just kill ourselves and have to deal with that. But I had a last bullet for the first couple months and then I switched over to a last grenade. So the idea being that if, I, if I'm in that situation, I'll pull that and see if I can take as many of them out with me. When we liberate a village, most of the time they come out and they're just happy to see us. A lot of the times they'll take off their, if the women have been forced to wear the black gowns, which they always have been, they, they, they'll take it off. <laughs> Sometimes the guys will start smoking because they weren't allowed to smoke. Hugs and kisses, lots of crying, stuff like that. It's not just a fight against ISIS, it's a revolution. You know, they're trying to create a real democracy in the Middle East. They're trying to liberate women from thousands of years of a very oppressive patriarchy. So to me, those things are worth, you know, putting myself out there and becoming a target. It's pretty common to find pregnant mothers and as soon as we rescue them, they're asking for abortions because they want to get rid of their ISIS babies. When ISIS went to Shingal, they took the, the girls and the women. I think it was 3,000 Yazidi sex slaves, women and little girls. And they, uh, they kidnapped them and took them to uh, mostly Raqqa and Mosul. And they sent them to slave markets where their fighters would buy them, I guess. And, you know, they were, their value was determined by how young they were, how pretty they were, if they had good teeth, just like you would cattle. <laughs> they would be used, raped repeatedly, and then when that, when their owner was tired of them, he would trade them or sell them to someone else. I know a lot of the girls are, they want to go back and just free those women, free those girls. That's a big motivation for Yabashe, the girls of the Yabashe, is to go back to, because they're the Yazidi girls, the ones who escaped, and they formed their own militia. They want to go to Raqqa and uh, get revenge. I get a lot of women write me, telling me how much I inspire them. But not just, you know, to be soldiers or fighters or anything like that, but just, they tell me to say, well, because of you, I've learned to stand up for myself. Or I'm, I've been in a bad marriage and I'm gonna leave it because you inspire me to be strong enough to do that. And like, to me, that's like, that's a huge honor. When I went there, I would tell people, I'm not going there to kill anyone, I'm going there to help people. But then, you know, a lot of friends get killed and you start to change, or I started to change my thinking about it, started to change. You know, we do what's called novici, which is like guard duty. It's generally, it's like an hour during the day, an hour during the night. But I would sit up there six, seven, eight hours, you know, just waiting, just, you know, please dear God, let me shoot someone in the face today. That's, what, that's the way it gets, you just, you don't care about them, they're not people anymore, you just wanna. I've been called crazy by a lot of people. For me to go back and do nothing and pretend that none of this is like, that there isn't a war here and people aren't being murdered and stuff like that, to me, that's crazy. ISIS wants to spread its ideology and the Kurds want to stop that. So really, the world owes the Kurds a lot. When you see in the news that ISIS has been beat in Syria, it's a big part, it's because of the YPJ. Long after ISIS is gone, the YPJ will still be there fighting for women's rights in the Middle East. I think that the future is definitely in the younger people, because even though some of the older people, they're still kind of bent on traditions and stuff like that, but I see in the younger people the change that can come. 
Yeah, even the guys are really on board with the women's revolution part. They seem to really want change. They really want to be part of the 21st century. I always felt like there was something bigger I should be doing. So and I just didn't know what it was. I didn't know what to do. And then this came along, and this was like perfect timing. And uh, the last almost three years have been the best three years of my life, even though you know, a lot of shitty things have happened. You know, I lost a lot of friends, but still. In some weird way, it's still the best three years of my life. <laughs>